Welcome to The Courage Effect. I'm Suzanne Weller, and this is a show about growth and unleashing what's possible. You will hear inspiring stories about what courage looks like, how we navigate what's getting in our way, and the opportunities that surface when we choose courage over comfort. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. This is Suzanne Weller. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are listening from. Welcome to The Courage Effect, where each week I talk with a guest about what they've learned through wrangling fear and risk, no matter how big or small the challenge. And today my guest is J.R. Siegel. JR is a sustainability strategist, writer, and business leader. He lives in Seattle with his wife, three children, and a very silly dog. <laughs> Professionally, he is the Senior Director of Product Innovation at HIG, a Series B sustainability SaaS company. JR is also a member of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee for the Tom Ford Plastic Innovation Prize, and the author of Bright Spots, a newsletter on LinkedIn that unpacks good news about the climate that you might have missed. And let's face it, we could all use a little good news, especially about the climate. Uh, previously, he spent six years working to build the sustainability organization at Amazon, and he's partnered with numerous organizations as a consultant and has lived, work, and done research in both China and Bangladesh. JR, welcome to The Courage Effect. Thanks for having me, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's great to see you and to hear you. Same. So obviously, when I read your bio, there's so much there about courage, which is what we're talking about today, because you have lived in various places. Um, you are doing such important work around sustainability. I'd love for you to talk about how you define courage for yourself. Yeah, thanks. You know, this was a really great prompt and something I thought a lot about. And for me, I kind of break courage down into the macro and the micro. So from like a macro context, for me, courage is about not settling for the status quo and trying something new, even when it could be a step backwards. So this is about leaning in where the outcome is unknown and could be high variance, could be better, could be worse. That tends to be things like changing career paths, you know, moving to a place like Bangladesh, going to China, et cetera. At the same time, I think that one thing that's great about courage is not only is it these big things in our lives, but it's a lot of what matters to us on the micro level. And so for me, courage is also at the micro level about setting boundaries that enable you to achieve balance across your professional and personal lives. I really appreciate that you're calling out the smaller things that it takes to do it, because I think those are the things that get overlooked, especially with boundaries. And I know for you, because you are a very devoted father. So how can you speak a little bit about that, how boundaries come into play in your life? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you an example from today. So currently we're in busy season at my job, but today is the preschool ice cream social from four to five. So I'm nice. prioritizing going to the ice cream social, after which I'll come home and make a quick dinner. And then it's the first day of parent pitch baseball practice. So then about 45 minutes in between the two. But for me, it's always been about creating that boundary and prioritizing my family and knowing that work can wait. The ice cream social can't wait. The ice cream is going to melt, right? Like we go to the ice cream social or we don't. There's no like, ah, oh, maybe we'll do the ice cream social next Wednesday. That's not a viable option. Whereas the email can always wait, as can the Slack message. Yeah, ice cream is the priority. I love that. Um, well, and you also, when you talk about courage not settling for the status quo, I think that is something that can happen on a daily basis with your family and with work, where it's so easy to prioritize a meeting or an email and to to not do that. So I do I do truly think that it takes courage to challenge that status quo. I think especially as a senior business leader. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that all the signals reward you for doing more and being more attentive, being faster, being more active. And so in your professional life, if all the positive signals are when you respond more quickly or show up for that meeting, you have to be very conscientious and thoughtful about breaking from that pattern. Yeah. Well, I'm curious when you have broken from the pattern, are there specific things that you've done where you've stepped into courage that have been unexpected and really made a huge difference in your world? Yeah. You know, I think for me, the thing that's been most important and that I keep reminding myself is to split the decision and feeling really great about trying something new or risking something and being okay with that outcome not being as good as I thought it could have been. So 
an example of this is I was part of the millions of folks who were part of the Great Recession. So I'd been in a great job for six or seven years, was growing professionally, growing personally, really enjoying what we were doing at Amazon. But it was a pandemic and I had a remote schooling kindergartner and another kid at home. And it was really clear to me that I couldn't be present for my family and do my job to the best of my ability. And so for me, that was courageous, knowing that I had to step back from my career for a moment and then not knowing when I was going to get back into the workforce or if that next job was going to fit what I wanted. You know, I had spent a decade from what I wanted to get into sustainability until I actually got into a job that kind of fit the, those criteria for me. And so stepping away from that, having spent a decade trying to get there was really hard. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that when you did it, you probably also had people that were questioning your decision. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, you get you get both. You get people who are questioning it, like my mother, like, how could you leave such a good job? Why could you do that? I don't understand. And on the other side, and I think this is where it's really interesting and where it was validating for me, where you, you get folks who say, boy, I really wish I had the courage to do that. I wish I could do that. But for whatever reason, there's something internally that's that's stopping me. I can relate to that when I quit my job and took a six month sabbatical and sort of decided to blow my professional life up. There were the, I was amazed at how many people came out of the woodwork and were like, oh my God, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. And what's fascinating is I found a couple of those folks I spoke with are still at the jobs they were that, I guess it's almost three years ago, two and a half. Yeah. But, you know, it's hard to see the bigger picture from the day to day, because we very rarely kind of look up, right? So you're focused on the next meeting, that next Slack message, that next thing you want to get to, as opposed to your macro view. Yeah. So now looking back, so three years later, what what did you learn? I learned a lot. Um, you know, one thing I learned is that it's easier, kind of from a professional perspective, you know, get a job when you have a job, which is such cliche advice, but in my experience has tended to be true. Um, another thing that I learned is that um, pursuing your passions and things you're interested in, if you have patience, can lead to unexpected and interesting outcomes. So for me, I love to write. I've always loved to write. Ever since I was an undergrad, even before, I've always loved to write. And so when I was on my sabbatical, the way that I stayed involved was just writing. Just as, as you saw, I now have a newsletter on LinkedIn, but like I just put stuff out into the ether. And it was one of these weak connections of a friend of a friend of my wife. So I had written something which led to a couple conversations, which turned into some of the consulting I had done. And so I think just being open to a whole variety of possible selves and future outcomes was really key for me and not being totally wedded to my next step has to be like a clear step up, whatever this ladder I have in my mind is. Yeah. Cause it's really a jungle gym, isn't it? <laughs> it's totally a jungle gym. But like the thing I think that is so interesting about that is like, everybody says it's a jungle gym, but implicit to that for me is so many people are like, well, yeah, it's a jungle gym for other people, but my jungle gym always goes up and to the right. Like, you know, 90% of people think they're in like the top half of anything. So yeah, yeah, it's a jungle gym for those other folks. Me, I'm telling you, it's up and to the right. My jungle gym is just going to the top. Like there's none of this down, there's none of this sideways. And of course there is, um, but that takes a little bit of humility, um, which which is helpful, but can be challenging. Well, and it, it's so poignant too, what you were talking about future selves, because it is that idea of when you open yourself up to those possibilities, who who really knows what's possible, not just for what you're going to do professionally, but who you're going to be. Yeah, totally. And I, you know, I don't think I even know what my best self is, like what my potential is, what the things I'd be most kind of in flow doing would be. Um, I have some guesses, but some of my past guesses have not been correct, right? It's hard to know um, unless you do. I'm curious, do you go through a certain practice or like when you have those guesses? Like, I mean, I remember at one point a friend of mine said I needed a rubric for saying no to things <laughs> because mm -hmm. I had started my business and I was saying yes to too much. So I'm curious, do you have a rubric for what you say yes to? It's a great question. You know, I don't I don't have like a formal rubric. I'm not 
like a spreadsheet, put it in a rubric type of a person. I think what what I have responded to, and this is a book we, we've shared and we both really like, is a book like Working Identity by Ibarra, where there's this concept of like, you can't really know what something is like until you try it. It's almost like you can't understand somebody's life until you walk a mile in their shoes. And that is so true. And so for me, I think what's helped from a rubric perspective was this concept of testing. Like I'm testing. So coming out of, of you know my sabbatical, I'm testing what it's like to do consulting on my own. Do I like that? Is that fulfilling? Is that serving my greater purpose? Or are the things that I thought were going to be really great about that, like maybe not real or maybe not as great as I had perceived them to be? Yeah, there is that. I mean, and I, that one of the things I love so much about that book by Herminia Barra is that, yeah, the experimentation. How can we, how can we really embrace experimentation? And you seem to me like somebody that has really done that quite a bit in your larger professional career. Yeah, no, thank you for that. You know, I think part of it again comes back to this idea of of courage and just, you know, not necessarily being okay with the status quo if you don't feel like you're doing, you know, what you can do at, at your at your best. And so I guess while I don't have a rubric, I do have like these kinds of ways that I think about this across both personal and professional axes um, that I've started using recently that I really like. And so think of it almost maybe as a bullseye, like in the middle is like love. That's like something that you love to do in your personal life, as well as your professional life. Like you're in flow, you're loving your job, you have time for your family, your hobbies, your imbalance. Next is like. So that's something where like you like it. It's good. It's not perfect. The, the next layer, which isn't as good as can. Like, yeah, I can do that. I can project manage. Do I love it? Yeah. Am I great at it? Yeah, I'm okay, but I can do it. The next level is could, which is like you imagine this future of like, yeah, I, I could do that. Might not be the best. I, I could travel a lot for work. I'm not sure I would like to, but I guess I could. And then there's the can't or won't. Like I can't be an opera singer and I won't live in a different city than my family. And so every time I have a test, I try to see where do I think it falls on those axes. And then I try to recalibrate and figure out where it actually is based on where I thought it was be beforehand. I would love to dig in more about that test. I have a couple of questions that I wanna ask you, but before I do, we're gonna to go to a break. So for all of you out there, this is Suzanne Weller. This is The Courage Effect. I'm with J.R. Siegel. We will be right back. Job search doesn't have to be painful. Wouldn't it be great if you had someone to guide you through your job search or career exploration? Since 2013, Plum Coaching has provided job search, career coaching, resume, and LinkedIn profile expertise to clients around the world. Plum's coaches are former recruiters who have more than 15 years experience in every type of industry, including tech, real estate, construction, manufacturing, and nonprofit. Their coaches take what they know about hiring and put it in service to their clients. If job search is a challenge, or if you're exploring a new career direction, Plum is here to help. They'll work with you to turn what feels like a slog into an adventure. Visit PlumSeattle.com for details and information on their services. Maybe it's time for a partner like Plum. No other station delivers this much variety. Alternative Talk 1150. Welcome back to The Courage Effect. This is Suzanne Weller, and my guest today is J.R. Siegel. And we are having a great conversation about can't, could, like, love. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you can you go back a second just around the structure? Because I do think it's really vital for us to think about what are the things that we like doing? What are the things that are nice to have in our life? What are the things that are must-haves versus what are the things that we're ready to maybe say no to or we're definitively going to kick to the curb? So I'm curious if you can just sort of recap a little bit and let's dig in on that. 
Yeah, happy to happy to recap. Um, yeah, so at like the at the best level is like stuff that you love, right? So this is like sent me high. You're in flow. Like everything is just working. You're in balance. The next level is you know you like, and so that's something that's good, but maybe it it could be better. And then you kind of get into these middle layers that I think can be really really dangerous around can, which is something I can do. I can tolerate. It's not great, but you know, the unknown is scary. And so I'm going to stick with it. And then there's the could. And I think with could, it's something you can talk yourself into. And then the last level is this really stronger level of you can't or won't. So you have like this bright red line or this hard boundary. And, and what I think is so important about having a framework like this is that the goalposts always move in life. Like, Something that was on the verge of can't or could magically over the course of a year or 18 months professionally becomes something you like. You, it goes to can because you do it okay. And then it ends up in like. And then you, you stand back and you're like, how did I get here? How did I drift from where I wanted to be to where I am today? And I think it's not having a good sense of, of these um, different levels. Yeah. How do you know? How do you know? You know, I really like this concept from Adam Grant's book, Think Again, where you do a self-review check-in with yourself every six or 12 months. And I think this is a really important mechanism. And it's something that I've been doing recently. I just came up to a year at my current job. And so every six months I check in and I say, how did I think this was going to go? I've written it down. Where is it? And, and what do I want to do? based on that feedback. And so for me, also as somebody who's who's Jewish, one thing that I've done is I've, I've decided every year around Yom Kippur to kind of reflect on the last year and then talk about things that I wanna do or I'd like to see one or three years in the future. And then each year, uh, my wife and I sit down and we look at those lists and we say like, where have we hit? Where have we missed? What do we wanna, what do we wanna reflect on? What do we wanna change? I love that. I love a great reflection practice. I think it's so yeah. essential to make sure we're putting our energy in the right place. Yeah. And you see some of those big things always come up and like, I'm going to do it in three to five years or next year is going to be the year. And some things just have a tendency to slide. And so that's where having that process, I think, helps me feel more courageous about getting ready to take some of those actions. Yeah. Well, and it's, you're also anchoring on something that I do pretty regularly as a coach with clients is, you know, determining or coming, reconciling can't and could, mm -hmm. because it's so easy for us to say, I can't do that. And, you know, like we have talents and we have skills. And a lot of the time, mm -hmm. you know, like I don't have a musical moan on my body. Like that doesn't mean you can't play an instrument. <laughs> And language can be a really powerful thing. So I'm, are there any, are there any recent can'ts or coulds as far as shifts for you? Yeah. I mean, I'll give you one is that, so I said earlier, like I, I view myself as a writer, but I've also always viewed myself as somebody who's very analytical. And so I just thought I can't ever come up with anything creative. Like it's just outside my core competence. I'm very nervous about it. But but actually to help my two older children sleep, I've been telling them this story every night, serialized for the last three months. And so what I've realized is that I can tell stories. It's just that they're not very good, but that's okay because my kids like them. So I can do it, but I don't think I could be a published children's story <laughs> author. But that was one of those things where I can do. Similar, I wrote my first poem recently in a very long time, which I hadn't done since third grade. Wow. I love that. Also, not not publishable, but, you know, it's it existed. And it was really empowering for me to try something that I'd been nervous thinking that I couldn't do and realizing that it's okay to do things and enjoy them, but not be great at them. Like you don't have to conflate enjoyment with great skill. Yes. Yeah. There's a difference between doing karaoke and singing at the <laughs> opera. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, and you also talk about, you know, so not settling for the status quo is being a courageous thing. I'm curious for you. So when you are trying new things, how do you, how do you pick those things? You know, I I tend to start with a hypothesis, kind of going back to those two axes of like, what do I think I really like to do? Or what do I think my purpose is? 
And then once I kind of zone in on that area, then I try to do stuff. And so for me, like this current role is a great concept of an experiment. And so I've been in sustainability for a decade. I'm very passionate about it. I believe very much about trying to use my skills and capabilities to mitigate the worst impacts of climate. And one of my hypotheses is I can do this in my professional life. And so in this role, I'm trying a couple of things like, do I like working at a Series B startup? How do I like working in a small software company? How do I like being a leader at scale where I haven't been a leader at scale really in the past? And so I'm trying all those different things at the same time. And every few months I'm thinking back of which ones of these are how I'd expected, which ones aren't. Um, that's been it's it's been interesting and challenging, definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you're learning a lot through that process, though, because you're also you're reconciling not only maybe what you want to do, but also maybe learning some new skills in the process. Absolutely. And understanding what are things that in the past were such a core part of my life, like places that have a lot of infrastructure um, and like bristling at all the infrastructure. And why do we have so much process at this big company? It's so bureaucratic. And then, then you get to somewhere that's a startup and has no infrastructure. And you're like, well, it turns out I like infrastructure. I, I just wish I had a hand in creating some of it. Um, so, so that's been interesting of just trying to calibrate because um, we so anchor on our experience today that, that sometimes we over-index on the negative components of that or the things we don't think we like. Yeah. I'm curious with your job at Higgs, since you just hit your anniversary, happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, what what are some of the courageous things that you've done there? Well, I'll, I'll give you a few um, things that I, that I think are courageous. Um, one is a very micro thing and quite personal, but it's actually had a big impact on my ability to be courageous at the macro level. And one of those things I did on the first of the year was turn off my self view in Zoom. And so it's a totally hybrid workplace. Actually, it's totally asynchronous. It's totally remote. And what's been great about turning off my camera is that it enables me to be more honest and courageous in my conversations. Because when I had my camera on, I was performing for myself. I spent my entire time on Zoom looking at myself, figuring out what my facial expression looked like. Was I engaged? Was I not engaged enough? And now when I'm talking to you with my camera off, I'm gesticulating with my hands. I have a pencil in one of my hands. I'm moving. I'm leaning back. And these are all these types of things that I would have been so self-conscious about in my previous context that I wouldn't be comfortable with having those harder conversations. And I'm having one right now about like, what's my edge? Like, what is the work I can do? And what is the work that I won't do? And so I'm really in the process of having that conversation with, with my management. It's been hard, but it's been a little bit easier because I don't have my camera on. So that's my big piece of advice to folks out there. Turn off your camera because I think it allows you to be more in the moment and more honest. Just imagine if you were at a coffee shop with your friends and while you were talking to your friend, you had a camera or like a mirror behind their head and you were like talking to them, but kind of looking at yourself like They'd be like, hey, jerk, you're here to focus on me. We're here to engage. We're not here for you to look at yourself in the mirror behind me. It's like, uh, you know, if you used to go to like a, a restaurant and uh, there was a TV and somebody staring at the TV. Yeah. You know, I'll just ask them to switch seats. It's like, I don't want to be here while you're really just watching the TV. I want to be here with you. It's so interesting that you bring this up because it is such a, it seems like such a small action. I mean, something that is, it doesn't really make a big impact. And it's so interesting that you noticed that the, that you stopped performing for yourself and you stopped editing yourself at the same time. Totally. Totally. And, and what was cool about this one is that it's not one that other people need to know about. Like I'll tell folks about it, but it doesn't change our engagement right now from your perspective. Like yeah. you still see me just fine but it really changes how I can engage with you and how I can be present and show up. Yeah. And everybody wins from that. Exactly. Yeah. I thank you for that. Guess what I'm going to be doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta let me know how it goes. Yeah. I'm telling you it's a, it's a real game changer. It's subtle, but it's, it's been profound for me. 
Well, and it's, it is the whole idea of, I mean, when we're in all remote work environments, it, there is that challenge and making sure that we can be as present as possible. And also I'm, I know that the cognitive load is heavier when we're also forcing ourselves to look at ourselves. Totally, totally. And I, you know, in, in my work and with my colleagues, like I need them to trust me. I need to want, I want to be trusted and be a, a good sounding board and give people the best advice and show up and give them the best that I can. And I couldn't do that when I had this performative component of my engagement with others. And so it wasn't fair to them either. Well, thank you for that. So everybody who's listening to this bonus points, if you turn off your self view or hide your self view. <laughs> moving forward. Uh, but I like that. I like that as an experimentation to try it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's great. Totally. So as we wrap up our conversation, JR, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd love for you to share with our listeners, what's the best place for them to get in touch with you? Yeah. So the best place to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. I'm relatively active. And so the, it's just my name at LinkedIn. Um, and then as Suzanne mentioned in the beginning, I just started a newsletter called Bright Spots. Um, and so I'm posting that through LinkedIn at that point. And for me, that's been another point of being more courageous is like, I'm putting stuff out into the world that I hadn't done before. And another thing I'm doing in this that I find to be somewhat courageous at the pride of my wife is to not have every single sentence footnoted and documented. But it's like courageous is like allowing my authentic self to show up and not feeling like I need to hide behind like the analytical rigor that we all had when we were in school. And so that's yes. another way I'm pushing my boundary. Um, so a little bit more of my voice, a little bit less hopefully sounding like a term paper. So um, <laughs> that's... Well, and more real at the end of the day, right? Because it's really and truly you and you get to step into that creativity and good for you and move away from perfectionism. Yeah. Right, <laughs> so... but that's really hard for me. Like not being able to hide behind um citations it's yeah. taken a lot for me and it's still something i'm working on so that's one of the big things i'm focused on to be more courageous about going forward awesome well wishing you continued success and uh thank you for spreading the word of courage and not hiding um such a pleasure to talk to you thank you everybody so much for being here today stay strong stay courageous and uh we will hear from you soon take care thank you so much for having me